All right, we're starting. Here we go. 20. Make sure we got this. All right, here's your ligaments. You need to know these ligaments. You got an MCL. Keep pulling out. MCL. Now you hear these letters all the time. So you got to have an idea of what you're hearing. MCL, LCL, ACL, PCL, medial meniscus, lateral meniscus. All right? Medial refers to what? Towards the, so the center. That'll work. Towards the midline. Lateral, away from the center, away from the midline. Posterior and the anterior. Well, here's the cool thing about an ACL and a PCL. They both have an anterior attachment, and they both have a posterior attachment. So we've got to figure out which one we're talking about. All right? And we have meniscus. That's those uh, funky little cartri uh, cartilages that we got. So, oh, wow, you got it on there. I added this picture to here. All right, so when we see this great big side over here, all right, the, the one that's closest to the furthest right, to your right, is that the medial side or the lateral side, and how can you tell besides them putting that label to it? No, a laser won't work on that. It's over here on this side. This side, is that the medial side or the lateral side, and how can you tell? All right, think about what you just learned. Okay, we had two bones in the lower leg, right? What are they? The tibia and fibula. Where's the fibula? On the lateral side. So when you look up there and you see that picture over here on the lateral side, right above the eye, that is the, tibia, uh, the fibula. And so when you see this fibula, you know, okay, that's the lateral side. So how it all works together. So you can see that the medial collateral, which is in the middle on your right side, okay, on this side, it's huge, isn't it? But what about the one on the other side, the LCL, the lateral collateral? Yeah, it's like the size of your pinky, about that wide. The MCL is about the size of this. The other one is the size of that. Why would why it's a huge difference? Why would that be? Because medial has more stress. Yes. So how often do you get stresses to the lateral collateral? What's the unprotected side? The outside or the inside? The out well on on. The ligament itself, yes, but the you have nothing past your la as farther lateral. That's it. There's nothing there. You get hit by people, by cars, by dogs, by whatever, right? So that in turn takes the force in. So the inside's got to be thicker than the outside because if I if I'm worrying about here, I've got all of this to protect that lateral collateral. Right? So when we got made, the physicist said, the engineer said, well, we need more on that side. They went on the other side. Okay? So the lateral collateral connecting the femur to the tibia. What could be another name for that that you might hear? Something collateral ligament. It's medial collateral, but what else can it be called? Tibial collateral ligament. Yeah. And now on the other side, what can that be called? If it's the on the lateral collateral, it's going to connect to the other bone. What is it? The fibula. So that's the fibular collateral ligament. Okay? Now, you see in the middle of this guy's knee or this this drawing? All right. Cruciate. What is we've heard that. Sort of something like that before, hadn't we? Cruciate. What else does it sound like? Cruciate.
crucify, right? Which is a cross, which they cross in the middle of the knee. So, how do we know which one is which? By the position on the femur or the tibia. How do we know which one's the anterior cruciate? By its position on the tibia or the femur. It is the tibia, exactly. So, you can see it's got ACL. That one on the tibia is a whole lot more anterior than what you see on this next slide or on that side where it comes from the front and goes to the back. All right? What are the job of what's the job of a ligament? Connect bone. So when you've got a great big joint like a knee, you need great big ligaments and you need several of them. Okay? It's a hinge joint. Essentially, it's only supposed to go back and forth. Now, we've got to stop all of that other motion. And so we're so the engineer decided to use ligaments. The anterior cruciate keeps the bottom, the tibia, from sliding out forward from the femur. The posterior cruciate keeps it from sliding backwards. All right? The MCL keeps it from opening up, and so does the LCL. They also get a lot of help from muscles. Now, if you see these little O's, there's a C and an O on the top of the tibia. That's your meniscus. Okay? Not a whole lot of... It's not a... It does not have a great amount of blood supply. So you start tearing that up, usually you have to have it in a second. But there are places on here that has a better blood supply that they try and save it by stitching it. All right? So there's your patella, which is right in the middle. Patella is also your common term is what? Your kneecap. Yes. There's a lot of stuff on here that's missing. There's retinaculum, there's popliteal, which is in the back. But patella, the tibia, the fibula, and the femur. So there's your four muscles, there's your four bones that make up that make up your knee. You have your patellar tendon, your hamstrings, your quadriceps, and your gastrocnemia. Those are the muscles that are going to help assist in keeping the knee in place. Right? So we see the word quadriceps. How many muscles make up the quadriceps? Exactly. And you can tell because it's a quad, right? So hamstrings, technically, some people say that there's three, but one of them is a bicep. And so if you ask a an orthopedist, since it's a bicep tendonitis or bicep ten, uh, muscle, then he'll say it's two. We had that one time. So the quads are in the front, the hammies are in the back. Okay? There's your meniscus that you can see, the patella. The quads come down and they all fuse in together to make your patellar tendon. And then they land right there where it says tibia. See where the word is? Oh, let's go back. So it lands right there, and that's called the tibial tuberosity. So when those quad muscles shorten, it pulls your leg into an extended position straight by that attachment right there where it says tibia, but that's tibial tuberosity. Okay? Patella, patellar, patellar tendon, or some folks call it a patellar ligament. I call it a patellar tendon because it's technically, well, you get there, you get patellar tendonitis, and that's usually right where it is. All right, on the back of it, on this side, turn my little light, light. On that side, right there, that piece of meat right above there, that's the gastroc. What are they? What's that also known as? Baby cow. cow. A calf, exactly. So. Oh, that's big, like, right yes, big thick. Yes, that is it. Okay? So you know that the calf, the calf muscle comes up and above the joint line. The hamstrings come below the joint line. So in the middle, there's the joint line. The one comes up, one comes down, so it's surrounding it. All right? 
It's metella. It's a sesamoid bone, which means it's more or less a floating bone. All right? It's the largest sesamoid bone in the body. Can you tell me where you find another sesamoid bone? We've already covered it last year. It's in the foot. Yes. Where? Getting all excited? Where in the foot? That's not in the brain. How about the ball of your feet? Underneath the, your big toe, the ball of your foot right there, you have another sesamoid bone. So, now, how does, how do you get in trouble with the patella? You get in trouble with the patella by how it tracks. And when I say tracks, it means in that groove behind it. Okay, let's see if I've got another picture here. See how the femur has got one and then two condyles? It also comes in and makes a valley. And that valley is where the patella is going to sit. So however it tracks, it should stay in the middle of the valley. If it starts wanting to go to the east or to the west, what happens to the back of the patella? There's my femur. Here's my patella. If I'm in the middle, I'm going great. What happens if I'm... Yes, it rubs it. It starts hitting the femur. That's not good. Because on the back of the patella, we have a really thin hyaline cartilage. And that hyaline cartilage uh, doesn't need to be tore up. So, bent upon the pole of the quads and the patellar tendon, the depth of, and the depth of the femoral condyle, the shape of the patella. So, if you'll see the anterior, which is the front, so if I'm looking at you and I say, okay, we're going to pull the skin off around your patella, you're going to see this. Now, if we cut your patellar tendon and look underneath the patella, underneath it, it's got the, the articular surface. Well, bone can be pretty rough, which is the outside of it. But underneath it, where it comes next to the, the bones in your knee, it's going to have that cartilage on it. And so it's all shiny and smooth. It's nine to ten times slipperier than ice. So think about going ice skating you know, or just walking on ice. That's not even close to what that hyaline cartilage is going to be under your patella. So... Here's just the normal patella where it just goes up and down. All right, we get one that sublux. All right, we've seen this before. I know you all have seen somebody out here that had their patella fall off, right? Or get dislocated or even sublux. We had the one boy that moved in last year. He had a problem with his kneecaps, right? Remember him? Okay. Uh, let's see here. Who, oh, who, oh, who. All right. Sarah, since you're sitting there. All right. This is the one thing I want you all to do. Is I want you to take your leg. Have it relaxed. There's your patella. All right. So go ahead and feel your patella. Make it move. All right. You can't do it unless your foot. No, because your foot's not on the ground. Your quads are holding it still if you're holding your leg up. So, okay. So if we want, remember we talked about subluxations a long time ago. A sublux is a partial dislocation. So, if on the bottom of the patella it's got a groove or a ridge in it to fit in the groove, what happens then if it bumps over? Now the, now the, the patella is going to be way on the outside, and it's sitting over here. It looks funny, all right? The very first time I ever saw a dislocated patella, okay, was he came running into the training room, and he goes, Mr. Davis, somebody, he popped his patella out. I said, oh, you're kidding me, right? He goes, no, he popped his patella out. Some football player years ago, put his knee in a precarious position. He says, if you ever want to hurt somebody, you just take this, and he pushed really hard, and he dislocated his own patella. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it wasn't here, but yeah. 
that's that's boys for you. You know, they've got to play around. It feels a little weird when you go out that far, doesn't it? So. It can. Her question is, is if, it, as far as the dislocation, will it only dislocate laterally to the outside? It can come this way, but 99 probably percent of the time, it's going out here. These muscles on the outside are stronger than this one here for the most part, and anatomically, it's just easier for that to pull out this way. So, what do you do? What do you do as far as student trainers? Come get us, yes, put ice on it, worse, well, it's not hard. It's not hard to put it back in. You just think about anatomy, okay? Remember, if you've got a dislocated shoulder, they're muscle guarding and holding the shoulder out. Well, that's the same thing here. So if we get them to, to relax, all right, come and lay all the way down. Now, how do we stretch quads? All right, to stretch your quad would be to bend and then extend the hip, right? That's going to that's gonna stretch your quad. If your hip is extended and your knee is bent, it's pulling the quads. It's pulling the quads as much as it can. So we got to do the opposite. We got to extend the knee. And flex. Because now, as long as she relaxes, all you do is you just take your finger, go underneath it, and it'll just jump right over. Now, that's all it is to do. But uh, do I want you to do that? Absolutely not. They'll fall down. Although I will tell you, I will tell you. I'll tell you this though, is that if they are standing up, a lot of times, you know, just as a as a reaction. Once they step up, the quads are strong, so they might pull it over. Okay, and if it, yeah, it will hurt. All right, there was one guy that, uh, you know, I saw the one dude do it to himself. Another kid that year, I saw two in a row, essentially the same day. Then there was another year that I saw three that year, and one was during a ball game, and I reached down and I pushed it up over. And he took a deep breath, and he looked up at me, and he says, oh, I love you. Because the pain immediately diminishes. You don't want them to. All right? And we'll get in. Let's see if we have that farther down the road. I don't think we do, do we? No. Yes, they need to be in a straight leg immobilizer and keep your leg straight for four to six weeks. Yes. All right, because, put your leg out again. All right, what's holding this in from going this way and this way is some tissue over here. All right, and tissue over here. The retinaculum holds it. And as this goes this way, the thing is, if they dislocate their, their patella, they're not hurting on the side that it dislocated. Because that side gets shorter. This side is where it hurts because it gets stretched. So it's going to hurt on the medial side just off of the patella itself. So that's going to help you as far as knowing whether or not you've got somebody who's got a subluxation or a dislocation. If you dislo dislocate it one time, you've got a whole lot higher incidence of it dislocating it again because of this. Two things that they've been talking about, one of them is, is that they take cadaver tissue and make like a little bridge from here to the femur. Cadaver tissue, got it? To make like a, a false ligament to hold it in. The other thing that they can do is go on this side and do what's called a lateral release. 
And so they'll release, they'll cut this tissue on the other on this side so that it doesn't pull as hard as what it used to. Do you need a patella in order to live a regular life? No, you don't. What does the patella do? It doesn't it does do something. Okay? It makes you it makes your muscles in your quads more efficient. Okay? So let's just say that we take you and we go and we test your, your quads on a uh, isokinetic machine. It tells how many foot pounds he's able to push against. Okay? Then we go and we take her patella out. She will have probably half, if that, of her strength. Although there's nothing wrong with your quads, but you will not be able to push off enough, et cetera, without a patella than what you do with one. Because it's nothing but physics. Meaning, oh, there's all this stuff. That's all right. We're going to draw on here. So if I've got a pulley right here and a string, and it comes straight down, right? If I pull the string, is the pulley going to help? Yeah, it, it, it'll help a little bit. But what if I take the pulley and extend it a little bit, and now it comes this way, and I'm trying to get this to come up. It's really going to help now because I've gone farther than what the axis is. And so that's what the patella does, is it makes... Right, but we're connecting, we're only connecting to here. So if I've got this here and it comes straight to the top and then come over, right? You try and pull that, it eventually will come up. But you're going to have to use a whole lot more strength in order to bring it up. If I go out farther and give it a head start, all right, to where now it can, we can get it to start going this way, it's going to come up a whole lot easier. So, there. No, I'm just saying that if that's what your patella is. That's the job of the patella, is to make a fulcrum. Is to make a fulcrum. Putting it back in place, you're done, except for x-rays. Because you want to get x-rays to make sure you haven't chipped off a piece of the bone of the patella or the femur as it jumps. Now, it's going to be mad. So what? You just reach over. It, it comes. It, it jumps. You just take your hand. As long as you get it up, you can take your finger and just just bring your push, and, and it, it'll jump over. Not me. Doesn't hurt me. It hurts them a whole lot less once you get it in. Once they have it in, it's instant relief. You're going to have some soreness over here, and it, but essentially, it's instant relief. It will swell. Yes. I don't think y'all are old enough, but we had the redheaded boy that did it all the time. Yeah, you're not old enough. All right. So let's talk about your meniscus. People call it cartilage. All right. You have a C shape, and then if you'll notice, there's an O shape. Now let's go back over here to that slot, that picture that had that in there. You can see one of them is a C shape. Right? So the C shape is your lateral meniscus. It's like a racetrack. You know, the racetrack's banked out here. It helps hold the femur in place. Okay? So you've got a C shaped fibral cartilage is located on the tibia on the medial side. The O shape located on the lateral aspect of the tibia. And they both limit movement. And they serve as a cushion for a knee joint. You halfway tore your meniscus. Did you have surgery? And how old were you at the time? And at eighth grade, they might just say, we're going to leave this alone. So here you go with how these tears are. Okay? I can't see that far, so I have to get closer. All right. So this first one where it's got this itty-bitty circle, it's an itty-bitty tear, OK? 
Okay? That one actually is close to a blood supply, so they very well may elect to go in and put a stitch in it. But now you're done. You're done with athletics for eight weeks, 12 weeks, and you're non-weight bearing, and you are straight leg, just as if you dislocated your pella. But it's even longer because you you got to wait for that to try and heal. And with a low blood supply, it's going to heal, but it's really a long time. So then you get this one. It's not over in the posterior horn, but it's there in the middle. And since it's away, what they'll do is, is they'll take this and they'll try to start here and keep it round and come around and take this little part out. Now, that's better than taking out all of your meniscus, but anytime you lose any of your meniscus that you have any invasion from the joint by surgery, you're looking that you're going to be arthritic. And the more that you take, the more that you're in trouble. And then you get the bucket handle tear. And the reason it's called a bucket handle tear is if you think of a bucket and you see a great big horseshoe, that's the bucket handle. That's how, that's how this one is. And so it'll go all the way around and pretty much 180 degrees. You've got to take all of that out. Because what the cartilage does is it will flip up. And then it gets stuck. And now you can't, you can't get your legs straight. Okay? You're constantly fighting the swelling. With either one of the first two, yes, that you're going to have swelling. You can get rid of the swelling. Can you play with those? Yeah, you can play. You know, you're a senior. You're playing your great, you know, your greatest season ever. You're a senior in high school. Yeah, you can go ahead and play. But here's the whole thing: if it gets worse, then you're done. All right. But you don't practice during the week. You get the swelling out. You go play. You're going to get swelling because that's going to pop up during the game, back and forth. And then we go through. Do it again the next week. We get rid of the swelling. We go play a game. We get rid of the swelling, we go play. Until that is finally trimmed out, you're eventually going to end up where you have the likelihood of not necessarily getting a bucket handle, but that actually getting bigger. So you have to be really, really careful as far as the meniscus tear. All right. The thing about that swelling is, all right, so we're going to take you right here, and we're going to put you on that same machine that measures how strong your muscles are. Okay? You're going to sit there and you're going to kick and pull, kick and pull. And we're going to get a good idea how strong one leg is. And then we'll put it on the other side, and then we're going to get a good idea how strong that leg is. Okay? Then I'm not going to take your patella out because that would be surgery, right? But I'm going to do something that's really simple, and I'm just going to take a little needle with sterile water or saline, and I'm going to put it inside the knee joint. There's no meniscus there, right? We didn't tear your meniscus when we did it. There's no ACL, PCL. There's no ligament damage. And we have done absolutely nothing to your quads and your hamstring. All we did was in the joint, we introduced a little bit of man-made swelling. We're going to then put you on that same machine. And we're going to test your quad strength and your hamstring strength. Do you know what happened? Huh? Yeah, she's weaker. But technically, she shouldn't be weaker because it's the same quads, same hamstring. And then we add a little more swelling, a little more man-made swelling. We only put like five cc's. Now I'm going to put like five or six, more, seven, ten more cc's in. And we'll do it again. You know what's going to happen? She's even weaker. Why is she getting weaker? Because the body starts to shut down when it has swelling in the joint because it knows that there, there's something wrong. So the brain just says, we're not going to fire off at the full rate. You've got something wrong. So that's why it's important that you get rid of the swelling when you've got a cartilage tear. When do we get, when do we get, oh, 24. We've got lots of time today, don't we? Yes. Huh? Ten after. I know. <laughs> Terrible thing. All right. Cruciate, we just talked about that. Okay. Put somebody on a cross, they are, come on, crucified. Happened on Good Friday. Okay? So, you're crucified because it's a cross. Well, since it's a cross, they have the anterior and posterior cruciate. And they do cross inside the middle of your knee. 
I can't reach in there and touch them, not without having portals and actually pulling on it through surgery. Okay? We don't want that. Cruciates are super, super important. We look in here, which is, this is the back, right? Because you know it's the front with the patella. All right? So what cruciate is this one? It is the posterior. And you can see that there's actually a posterior point for the anterior cruciate. But it's about where it is, the attachment on the tibia. They keep your leg from sliding out forward and backwards from doing that, okay? If you don't have those, and very few people can, can play athletics, but there are that can play athletics without having an ACL. There are probably more that can play athletics without a PCL, depending upon the position and what sport they're playing, okay? So, we have our cruciates. The anterior cruciate, it's got three bands, the anterior medial, the intermediate, and the posterior lateral band. All right. Prevent the femur from moving. Now, we're talking about the femur. So it keeps the femur from moving backwards. Got it? During weight bearing. Also stabilizes the tibia against excessive internal rotation. Okay? and serves as a secondary restraint to valgus and varus stress. So it does a lot. It helps keep this from happening, it helps keep that from happening, and it helps keep internal rotation from happening. That's the pretty main ligament, all right? So, the posterior. It's got uh, some of the posterior cruciate ligament. It's is taught, you know what taught is? Not that you were taught how to do math, but it's tight to the entire uh, range of motion. Acts as a drag during the gliding phase of motion and resists internal rotation. There we go again. Internal rotation. So you can see how important both of them are. They work together. In general, the posterior cruciate ligaments prevent hyperextension of the knee and the femur sliding forward. So, what do you see these guys? Who, who ends up with a PCL tear? Hut, hut. Quarterback. Hey, quarterback. He comes back, he gets ready to pass, he steps, and there's a, obviously a defensive guy is coming after him, right? Bam, and over the top they go. Okay? So it prevents hyperextension. So if you hyperextend too much, Tells you that Randall Cunningham had that happen to him. So they're fun. All right, there's your MCL. Okay, which one's the MCL? On this side or this side? Let's call it this and that, Sarah. This or that? Where's the MCL? Is it this or is it that? You tell me. You should know. Look at the anatomy. Is it? Why do you think it's a left leg? Which one? You just said it was left. Now you're telling me it's right? It is a right leg. All you need to know is this, right? So, here it is. There's your MTL. All right? They're actually a little thicker than what this, this one is on this model. All right? So, the MCL attaches to the joint above the medial epicondyle. So, it attaches way up here on the femur and below on the tibia. That's a pretty big attachment point, don't you think? Yeah, well, it does a lot, so it needs to be screwed down, right? You're just putting up a fence just to have a fence for decoration. You only put in two screws. You're putting up a fence to keep out the 150-pound dog next door. You're putting in nine screws, all right? That's a nine-screw fence. Got it? The major purpose is to prevent the knee from valgus, boom, from doing this, 
and external rotation. Okay. Now, I bet the LCL's next. It is the LCL. It's round, the fibers cord, sort of shaped like a pencil. All right. Not those big fat pencils that you used to get when you were in like uh, second grade. Yeah, they had the eraser that was like six pounds. Six pounds. So, it is attached to the lateral epicondyle of the femur and to the head of the fibula. So that's why you'll hear it called a fibular collateral and a fibular collateral. So if you hear that, you should say, oh, okay, I know where tibia is. It's collateral. Okay, I don't have that in my ankle. Here we go. You know where it is. So you'll be able to talk to the doctors and nurses and orthopods in no time. All right. The muscle, the musculature. Flexion. Is that executed by the biceps for more? See where it says by? So it means it has how many heads? Two heads. All right, the semitendinosus and the semimembranosus. So not only are you going to have to write them down, we're going to have an oral part to where you have to say what the quads are. So sweet, isn't it? So the semitendinosus and semimembranosus, the gracilis, the gastrocnemius, the popliteus, and plantaris muscles. That's what causes flexion. So you didn't even think about your, your gastrocs, actually your calves, helping with flexion of the knee, huh? Knee extension is executed by the quads. How many quads? How many, how many muscles are in a quad? Exactly. That's why they call it the quad. Here's the cool thing is, is that three of them are vasti muscles. So vastus medial, uh, medialis, lateralis, and vastus intermedius. So it tells you right there where they are. One's on the lateral, one's medial, and one is right in between them. All right? I don't think I have that on there. Where's the other one? Huh. The other one's the rectus femoris. So you need to write that down. Rectus femoris. I am right, aren't I? So. All right. The musculature. External rotation of the tibia is controlled by the biceps femoris. Internal rotation is accomplished by the popliteal, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, sartorius, gracilis, and the iliotibial band on the lateral side. Their primary function is to serve as a dynamic lateral stabilizer. What's the iliotibial band? You hear that in there. Don't worry about those first things. I'm not going to actually test you on the first two. But the IT. I just told you. You've heard of the IT band, haven't you? Not the informational technology band, but the iliotibial band. You see the people that come in and grab that deal, and they roll on it on their side, on their thigh? You don't ever see this? You've got to wake up. The, the little rolly thing. Yeah. Where you, you roll. Yeah. Yeah. You've not seen, you've never seen some, you've never seen somebody do this exercise. Now let me tell you something about this IT band, okay? It's not muscle, so it's not as flexible as muscle. So when you are doing stretching or whatnot, like muscles, when you're doing the IT band, you can't think of it. Well, this is how long I do muscle. You have to think of it. This is a really thick band. And I've got to just slowly move it up and back. All right? And it's not a 10-second stretch like a muscle. It's a 5 to 10-minute process. It's, got, it's just that much thicker than what you find in musculature. All right. I won't wear you out. We will stop right there. Tomorrow we'll talk about bursa. But tomorrow we will also have we will also have a quiz, okay? And that quiz is going to be that looks like a pretty good quiz right there. That quiz will be 
don't want to go that way. We'll go this way. That right there. Name the name the bones and the major muscle groups. So there's eight questions right there. 